The gift of God's love in us can bring light to any darkness. Welcome to worship at the South Freeport Congregational Church. We are so delighted that you are joining with us for worship. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, we welcome you to the worship and praise of God and to be a part of our great community of faith. Joining me in worship leadership are Pastor Jeremy Young, Linda McCullough, Tim Whitaker, Rosie St. Cyr, and our, amaz our amazing musicians, Dennis Drabinsky and David Watts. How blessed we are by the wonderful spiritual gifts and great talent in our congregation. I have a few announcements to bring to your attention. First of all, a reminder about the online thankful sale that our events team has prepared. We are so looking forward to it. It will take place in November, but the events team would also like to have some more donations. And in particular, they would like donations from you, perhaps something with a personal touch or some activity that you can offer to someone. Now they have lots of ideas and you can go to the website and find out more, southfreeportchurch.org, or maybe contact someone on the events team. We hope that you'll participate in our online thankful sale. Um, and also then when the sale is on, participate and perhaps bid on one of the items. And also from our missions committee, as you can, as you well know, the cold weather is coming very quickly. In fact, this week it's supposed to be quite chilly. And you know how difficult it is, my goodness, when you're homeless and you don't have a warm coat. Well, our missions committee is collaborating with Preble Street and Gray Street Ministries to collect coats, warm, warm garments for those who do not have them for these winter months. You can get in touch with Tim Whitaker if you would like to find out how you can make a donation of a warm garment or of a coat or go to our website again, which would have more information. We hope that you will be generous during this time. Coats, vests, sweaters, hats, gloves, scarves, and new socks. We hope that you'll be generous for those who do not have warm clothing for these winter months. And now let us prepare our hearts to be in God's presence. Take some deep breaths of God's peace. Just feel God's peace filling you, blessing you, strengthening you, and bringing you the healing that you need. And let us now hear our words of meditation and our opening prayer from Linda McCullough. Let us worship God. Good morning. The words to begin our worship come from two very different times. The first is from a 14th century mystic and Persian poet, Hafiz. And the second is from a 21st century writer, Anne Lamott, from her work, Traveling Mercies, Some Thoughts on Earth. An awake heart is like a sky that pours out light. The thing about light is that it really isn't yours. It's what you gather and shine back. And it gets more power from reflectiveness. If you sit and take it in, it fills your cup and then you can give it off yourself. I invite you to pray with me. O oh God, make our hearts places of peace and our minds harbors of tranquility. So in our souls, true love for you and for one another. Root deeply within us friendship and unity and concord. May we give peace to each other sincerely and receive it beautifully. With a spirit of reverence, we pray. Amen.
Hi everyone, it's Pastor Sally here, and I'd like to talk with you a bit today about Reformation Sunday. How many of you have heard the term Reformation Sunday? Do you know what it refers to? Well, today is Reformation Sunday, and the reason we honor Reformation Sunday is because it's about this guy. Do you recognize him? Do you know who he is? Can you shout out his name if you know? Well, his name is Martin Luther. He lived 500 years ago, and he is the one who started the Reformation. In other words, because of the efforts of Martin Luther, we started to have Protestant churches, and we're a Protestant church. So 500 years later, we are here because of the efforts of Martin Luther 500 years ago. Now, Martin Luther was a really, really smart man, and he was super busy. He wrote so many books. He was famous. People wanted him to come and talk. He didn't have a lot of time. And he also was someone who was somewhat full of himself, maybe a little, sometimes a little bit too much ego, rather full of himself and, and had a good sense of self-esteem. So one thing you wouldn't associate with Martin Luther necessarily is his being a thoughtful person. But in fact, Martin Luther, despite the fact that he was really busy, and even though he was famous, and he had so much to do, he was a really thoughtful person. He thought about other people and what they needed. Well, here's an example. His barber had the name of Master Peter. And one day Master Peter came to him and he said, Dr. Luther, I'm a person of faith, but I need help in learning how to pray properly and well. Now, Martin Luther was a busy man. He could have said, I'm sorry, Master Peter. I'm so grateful you're my barber, but I don't have time to teach you. But no, he didn't do that. Martin Luther went back and he wrote not just one, not just two, but 20 pages single spaced on how to pray. He wrote this pamphlet. He called it A Simple Way to Pray for Master Peter the Barber. Now, 20 pages doesn't sound that simple, but 500 years ago, it really was. But the fact is he took the time to be thoughtful and do something for Master Peter, the barber. And so what does that teach us? That no matter how busy we are, no matter how many things we need to do, we are meant to be thoughtful of one another, to think about other people, and their needs and do things for other people, especially maybe people who do things for us, your teachers, people who help you in the checkout line of, of a supermarket, so many people, your friends. The lesson we can learn from Martin Luther is that it's important to be thoughtful of other people and do things for them as they have need. And so I hope that you'll do that because that really is what God wants us to do. God wants us to be present to one another in a loving way and in a kind way and in a compassionate way. That's how Martin Luther was to his barber, Master Peter. And that's what God wants us to, how God wants us to be to each other, kind and compassionate and most of all, thoughtful. So I hope as we go forward, especially as we get closer to the season of Thanksgiving and get close to Christmas, that you'll especially be thinking of ways that you can be thoughtful to one another. You may not write 20 pages on prayer, but maybe there's something else you can do for other people to be thoughtful of them, because this is what God would like us to do. Can we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen.
another beautiful fall day in Freeport. The scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. The Lord said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to the Lord, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on those whom I show will show mercy. But, the Lord said, you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, See, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Here ends the scripture for today. May God bless the reading of these words. Good morning once again, everyone. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And this morning I'm reading from the New International Version. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by our hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out to you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. May God add a blessing to the reading of the word this morning, and may these words be hidden in our heart that they may guide us and lead us. Amen. Let us pause for a word of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I saw a cartoon recently that said, if 2020 was Halloween candy, and then the images of Brussels sprouts dipped in chocolate. Now, actually, I think that's an affront to Brussels sprouts because I love Brussels sprouts. I realize it may not be everyone's favorite, but I love them. But you get the picture. 2020 has been a really awful year. 
And I'm sure most, if not all of us, just want to say goodbye, get rid of 2020 and jump to 2021, if not 2022. And so here in this year of 2020, given all that we are dealing with, how does one even begin to think about stewardship, in particular stewardship in the church? In truth, there are probably a lot of really good, compelling reasons why you and I, all of us individually, and collectively shouldn't bother. We have some really good reasons why we shouldn't bother with stewardship. A very essential one, a basic one, this year of the pandemic has certainly altered, affected how we live out ministry in the church. What we do here in South Freeport is very different from how it's been in the past. We have had to make extreme adaptations as we have transitioned to virtual platforms, to technology-based ministry. We have had to make a lot of adaptations and not being able to worship in person to not be able to connect with our friends, our church family, to not be able to be engaged as directly in ministry in the community. Wow, that has been hard. And how can we think about stewardship when the church itself has just been so different and we don't know how it's going to be. We do not know ultimately what this pandemic is going to do and how the church, what the church is going to look like as things evolve from this time of this awful year of 2020. Thinking of our own personal and collective lives, this has been a rough financial year for so many people. People are hurting financially. How can we think about stewardship when finances are so hard for so many people because of the pandemic? And we think about our individual personal lives. So many lives touched, broken because of the coronavirus. We all know people who have been lost. We know how in so many ways this pandemic of the coronavirus has affected how we live. It has been really, really tough. And I know personally now in dealing with the illness of David in this pandemic time, and it has been heartbreaking. So this has been a really, really tough time for everybody personally collectively in community, and as a church. So how do we even think about stewardship? Should we think about stewardship? Is it just seem really inappropriate for this time? Well, as we look over history into the ebbs and flow of the church, over these 2,000 years, and even before, in the thousands and thousands of years, when the Judeo-Christian faith tradition was coming into being, there have been so many moments like this, when faith communities have been challenged almost to the point of saying, why bother? Why bother? Where is God? Where is God? Why has God abandoned us? Why has God let all this happen to us as a faith community and happen to us personally? And so that's why I think it's so amazing that we have the reading this morning that Tim shared with us, this reading from the book of Exodus. Now, Exodus is from those first five books in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, which is called the Torah or the Pentateuch. Now, Torah essentially means law or teaching. 
But the word Torah can also refer to shooting an arrow. And so for many commentators, the words we read in those first five books of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible hit the mark. They go right to the heart of what we are experiencing in life and open it up in vital ways and show us compelling things about God that we had not considered. And so the reading we heard that Tim offered for us today, I think hits the mark for us in this time of pandemic, in particular, as we are considering stewardship. So let's look at this story again, and let's look at the context. See, this story that Tim read follows upon that time when the Israelites in the wilderness were really getting impatient with Moses and with God. Moses had gone up to the mountain, and God was telling him all the commandments that he, that Moses needed to give to the people. Moses was creating these tablets, but Moses was just taking his time. He was spending too much up there on the mountain, and he wasn't caring about the people. They didn't see him. So the people rebelled. They rebelled against God. They rebelled against Moses, and they created idols, false gods. This, they created a golden calf. If, if God isn't going to be here with us, we're going to worship an idol. We're going to worship a golden calf. Well, God didn't appreciate that too much. And God said, I'm going to punish the people. And Moses got so mad that when he finally came down to the, from the mountain, I don't know if you realize this, those first tablets with the Ten Commandments, he threw them to the ground. He was so angry at the people for turning to false idols and turning their back on God and not trusting in God's leading, God's guidance, God's love. And those first tablets with the commandments, they broke, they shattered. And then Moses got angry at God because God said, I'm going to punish the people for creating this false idol. And Moses just said, okay, God, and this is where we get to the, our story today. Moses said, hey, God, I'm sorry. You have brought us this far. We do not have the evidence that you are with us. How do you expect us to go forward as a community of faith unless you assure us? that you are with us. Will you do that, God? Will you assure us that you are with us? Because if not, we're done. We do not need to do this anymore. We're done with trying to be faithful people. You know, I wonder during this pandemic time if maybe something like that ever came to our minds. Hey God, have you abandoned us? We're doing church so differently now and we don't like it. We're done. We don't want to do this anymore. Well, God came back to Moses and he said, I hear you. I hear your frustration. And I assure you, God said to Moses, I assure you that I'm going to be with you and I am going to be with the people. I will not abandon you. I am going to lead you to a place of fertility, a place of vitality, a place of grace. Please, Moses, tell the people to trust me because I am with you. Well, Moses had a big charge because he had to tell the people, trust in God. God is with you and God is going to lead you back forward to a place of vitality, a place of grace, a place of joy. You will see that land flowing with milk and honey. God is with you. Don't feel that God has abandoned you, even though it may feel that way. God is with you, even amidst the struggle, if not even more so. Well, after this story that Tim read, in which God assures Moses that God is there with the people and will not abandon them, God gives Moses a new set of tablets. Here there are the commandments, all the laws, they, they're written once again on a new set of tablets. 
And God affirms to Moses to tell the people that God is gracious and loving, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that God is forgiving and that God is compassionate, that God does not abandon God's people. Well, that was one instance. Let's think of another one. And it pertains to this day that we are recognizing, not just Stewardship Sunday, but Reformation Sunday. And so as I mentioned in the children's moment, this is a day when we remember Martin Luther. Martin Luther, who pounded those 95 theses, theses on the door of a church in Wittenberg, Germany. And why was he doing that? Because he was fed up with the church. He thought the church's ways were corrupt. He thought the church had lost its vision, its path. The church was not being gracious to the people. The church was charging people indulgences. That meant that in order to be forgiven, for a sin, you had to pay up. The church was corrupt. And Martin Luther said, forget it. That's not a church I can be a part of. Something needs to happen. Now, Martin Luther had a choice because he could have said, the church is so corrupt, I'm done with the church. No more. No more God. No more Jesus. I'm done. But he did not do that. Rather, he took it as an opportunity to challenge the church and say, I'm going to make something new. I know that God is leading me to create a new thing in the church that will be wonderful. And I'm going to trust that God is going to make that happen. So you see, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, when they were complaining that God was not with them, and Moses began to believe that too, and so why bother? God reminded Moses that God is with them and is going to do a new thing with them. And they need to have hope that their life of faith will be vital and restored. Martin Luther could have given up. He didn't. He persevered forward to take on what was he saw that was corrupt in the church and create grace. And so I'm wondering if that's our message for stewardship for this year, because it would be really easy, given what we all have experienced in our personal lives, in our community life, in the life of the church, in the life of a world right now that is so struggling. It is hard to get through the day without getting incredibly discouraged and depressed just by listening to the news as we're getting closer to an election as well. This is such a difficult time and it would be easy to say, we're done. Sorry, God, we don't feel you have led us well. We don't feel that you are with us. But in fact, in fact, this is not a time to give up. No. It's a time to persevere the way that Moses did with the Israelites. It's a time to persevere the way that Martin Luther did 500 years ago at that time of Reformation when a new thing was created. Because this is not a discouraging time in God's eyes. I truly believe this is a fertile time. This is a rebuilding time. This is a reimagining time. So rather than withdrawing, God needs even more of us in the church to recreate, to yield the fruits of what is going to be a fertile time and a time when we are going to sing a new song to the Lord and praise God for God's presence with us. The reality is, is that at those moments when we feel that God is furthest away, God is most present 
with us. The story of faith that we read in the Bible testifies to this. In the life of Jesus, in the Psalms, in the story of the Israelites in the wilderness when Moses leads them. This is a time when we are being invited by God to reimagine and recreate as hard as it is. So why, how do we do stewardship in a time of pandemic, in a time when so many of us are struggling personally? How do we do it? Because this is the time when we need it the most and when God needs us the most and when we need God the most and when we can be assured that God is with us even more strongly than God ever was before. And that is grace. That is wonder. There are so many things that God is going to see us make happen. God will not abandon us. This church was founded in 1856, and there have been many ebbs and flows, and God has never abandoned the church, and that's not going to happen now either. We, God is calling us to vitality, to fertility, to reimagining. So if ever there was a time for stewardship, it's now. God needs it now. And we each need it now. And so I hope in this time, we will all search our hearts and see how can we give of our time, our talent, and our treasure to ensure that God's grace in the South Freeport Congregational Church will be alive in new and vital ways. It may look different. We don't really know. But what we do know is that God will be there. And if God is there, that is all we need because it will be wonderful and beautiful.
as I was thinking about our time of prayer, I was reminded of a moment, a very endearing moment, back in my late teens or early 20s when I was teaching third graders vacation Bible school. On a given day, we were talking about prayer and the importance of prayer, not only to lift up our heart's desires and concerns, but also to be listening from God. And in that moment, we talked about how we close our eyes when we pray. I shared with them that we close our eyes so that we are not distracted by things that are going on around us. Perhaps if we were in church looking at what somebody is wearing, looking out the window to see what's happening on the street, even in these virtual moments of prayer where maybe we are looking at what is on someone's wall behind us. But it's all about coming into a place where we are able to focus all of our attention on God and closing our eyes in these brief moments allows us to do that. And even though these virtual moments of prayer, they may seem brief, I still believe that they are a moment for us to enter into a holy place with God that spans across any and all technology. In just a moment, if you are in a safe place where you may do so, I invite you to close your eyes as we join in prayer so that even in just this moment, we are focused on our community of faith and the loving presence of God that continues to bind us together across the miles. And so now I invite you to please close your eyes and bow with me in this moment of prayer. And I begin our time with just a brief moment of silence to center ourselves. A loving God whose spirit transcends the technology of our current moment, no matter when we watch and listen to this service in the day, thank you for your holy presence that abides with us. Hear our prayers as we gather. Hear the prayers of others as they are lifted up in these virtual moments together. From within our own community of faith, our list continues to grow. And this morning we lift up the following. Ruth, Happy and Jim, Vondella, Stephanie's husband, Joe, Bill, David, Joe, Branco, Jean, Spencer and Sandy, Mary Eliza, Margaret, Jean, Kathy, Dora, Nita's cousin, Wayne, Vicky's brother, John, Marlis's mother, Gloria, Sherry and Dan's son, Tyler, and Sherry's stepdaughter, Dawn. We remember each one of these for those that are struggling with illnesses, for those that are looking for work, for the grief of a loved one that has left us. Hear our prayers for healing, joy, guidance, and comfort. We lift up those in the path of forest fires currently burning in Colorado. We remember the people impacted, nature that is being destroyed itself and the wildlife that is also in such great danger. And so we offer the prayer, send the rains, O God, send the rains to heal this dry and parched land. And in our own state, in our own neighborhoods, we are so thankful for the rains that we have recently received here in this place of drought. We thank you, God, for these rains. We pray for our world, which continues to battle this pandemic of COVID-19. We pray for a miracle that will bring this challenging time to an end. In our country, the anger, the hatred, the division, and the fear that is so palpable all because of political lines. No matter where we stand, whisper in our ear each day as we go out into the world that we are still your children, God, that you still call us to make a positive, loving difference in the world around us. And it is my sincere prayer, God, that we each will be used by you to bring moments of peace, to show kindness, tenderness, love, and mercy to all that we meet along our way. Help us, God, to shine bright your amazing love in this world that sometimes may seem so dark. May we be used by you each and every day, and we give you thanks for the blessings of this life, for they are truly many. And it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.
And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God, our creator, the one who calls you beloved, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the grace and power of the Holy Spirit be with you, uphold you, and sustain you with joy and with love always. Amen.